Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the eighth edition of the European Film Festival. My name is Rosie Mutene, and I will be your moderator for this evening. Before we kick off this wonderful panel discussion, just a few house rules. Um, for those of you who don't know, in South Africa, we have rolling blackouts known as load shedding. And although our government has promised us that uh, load shedding has been suspended, it could happen at any point, but do not worry if that should happen. Um, my, my system will shut down, but then two to three minutes I'll be up and running again. Um, this is a Q&A session and we will have a panel discussion. And so sh should you have any questions or comments or suggestions, just put it in the chat room or the Q&A session for whatever platform you are watching on. So today we are discussing the film, The Bright Side, and this is in association with the Cancer Association on South Africa Cancer. Um, as we know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. The Bright Side is a phenomenal film, which I've had the privilege of watching. Uh, it is written and directed by Ruth Meehan, who's with us today, all the way from Ireland. And in uh, Cape Town, I think we have Anthea Lewis, who's also a breast cancer warrior. Uh, Ruth Mian is a writer and director who's been creating multi award winning and nominated works for both film and television, which can be seen in Ireland and Britain from as far back as the early 2000s. Uh, she graduated from Dublin City University with a BA Honours in Communication and at the NFTS in Beaconsville. And then in the UK, she got a master's in screenwriting. Our other panelist is Anthea Lewis, who's a warrior and cancer survivor and global hero for cancer. That is the Cancer Association of South Africa. Uh, Anthea unfortunately was diagnosed at the age of 38 with, breast, with uh, breast cancer. And at that stage, she was one out of three who was battling with cancer um, in her family. She's chosen to work very, very closely with children who have been diagnosed with cancer. And we're gonna find out a bit more about that powerful and, and fulfilling journey. But um, before we get into it, ladies, say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I know Ruth is, is, is joining us from Ireland. Um, um, Zanzi Magic, um, um, Zanzi, welcome to you. And thank you so much for joining this panel. Thank you. Delighted to have a chance to talk to you. So I'm going to get straight into it. The film, The Bright Side, as I said, I had the wonderful opportunity of watching. And it's the beautiful and very quirky and cleverly put together film about a stand-up comedian whose life changes forever with when she um, she's diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she then has to decide whether to face up to the condition and the treatment or to run away from her problems. And I'm not going to give you too much information because if you're part of the festival, you have the opportunity of watching the film. And it really, really is a great, a great piece of work. So first of all, Ruth, congratulations on the great, on the great film. But before we get into, into the panel discussion, I know there's an interesting story into how the project came about. Um, and I believe the idea came on a New Year's Eve while sitting at the airport. Uh, would you mind sharing us sure. that Sure, you know the way sometimes in life there's a moment um, and you know, even somehow, in, in, even at the moment you, that it happens, you kind of clock, some, this, is, this is significant. Um, at, the, at that time, it was 2014, I think, quite a while ago, and I was uh, the co-writer of the film, Jean Pasley and I, and um, we were actually looking for something to write together. And, but it was, um, it was a, a short a while after, um, I think it was nine or 10 months after I had lost my own sister to cancer. And um, I realized I needed some time out and I had booked myself on the cheapest flight I could find out of to, to go in India, which was on New Year's Eve. Um, so I found myself uh, at the airport alone, wondering what, <laughs> what I was doing. And I thought, well, uh, I'll, I'll get a book to read. And I went into the bookshop and I picked up, I saw on, on the table um, a book by a woman who actually had been in college with me, Anne Gildee. And it said, I've got cancer, what's your excuse? And um, I just picked it up and I took it with me. So it was my companion and, um, I found it incredibly, uh, I mean, it was, I loved the reverence of it and the honesty of it. And I found it somehow therapeutic for me. Uh, I think I was still, I had a little bit of arrested grief, you know, it's a process. And um, I just felt it connected me as well to my sister because she had a, a wicked sense of humor. 
and we'd been through such a dark time and I just felt there was something so refreshing for me about the boldness of dealing with cancer in a way that whilst hiding behind the curtain with it, it was just like, you know, you know, just face into it and laugh with it or at it and cry with it and be honest. And there was some kind of immediacy of the feeling of it. And so I just, I didn't feel at the time that I was fit for writing very much because, and, and then I, I, I contacted both Anne and Jean and, and Jean and I optioned the, 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 the book because we created the story um, which was very different from the book as in the whole narrative, but the inspiration was the main character. And Anne had uh, just, you know, she had been very inspirational in how she reported, it was a memoir. So it wasn't a novel, it was a memoir. And the way she spoke about her own experience um, was the basis for our, our main character. So that's how the story came about. And then we just wrote a first draft really fast. And um, mm -hmm. then it was a process of development over a number of years. We got support from Screen Ireland who were incredibly supportive to it from the start. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just one of those films where uh, it felt like it was always getting a bit stronger. Yeah. So it yeah. like it wanted to come into being. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, the, the, the film just doesn't only deal with the theme of cancer. There's so many other elements in it, which makes it such a great film. And we'll get into that. But you mentioned something about the boldness and, 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 and dealing with cancer. Um, Anthea, when, when you were first diagnosed um, and, you know, these different emotions that people go through when they realize or they found out their diagnosis, um, which go through a multitude of, of different emotions. How, how did you um, deal with hearing about it and how did you cope and come in? No problem at all. I think the, the first, uh, when, when I initially went for the checkup and after um, they told me that the A sample was, it is life changing, life altering. And I remember it was a Friday but it was one of those loneliest of Fridays. And I remember going home and not even telling anybody of, of my initial diagnosis. And I went back the Wednesday to the oncology um, ward where I saw the panel and there I decided, I'm only going to have the cancerous lump removed. I refused chemotherapy because I've journeyed with my aunt. And many times I would take and I would tell my family, I don't think I'm going to bring her back. Because I saw her at her worst. I saw her um, going through it where, where it basically, I used to go with her. I used to um, see people then when I go on my next visit, they weren't there. So I had that fear of chemotherapy and also being 38, more concerned about how I was going to look, how was my friends going to accept me. But the saying goes that, when days are dark, friends are few. And that was definitely the case with me. I soon realized that, yes, I heard the words, you have cancer. My life was... I'm so sorry to hear about that and, 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 and the way that you, you, you had to process that. Um, going back to you, Ruth, uh, the way the character in the film processed when they um, found out about their diagnosis. Um, do you want to talk about that journey and why you chose that theme as one of the main themes in the film? Yeah, um, I mean, who knows what cancer is? It makes no sense, mm. you know. Who knows? People come up with reach for all sorts of reasons. So course we do our mind does that but I, I you know but ultimately I guess the starting point for this character was so something quite contradictory because um, it actually had a, a marriage breakup before this and I had I had this realization the difference between being heartbroken alone and heartbroken with people is just night, night and day 
and yet for the person going in it with you you know you can so i think i was um very much connected to this character who was essentially lonely to start with and essentially um before anything she was ha cut off from life and she says it in a scene and, and when she says it's like i'm behind glass and um and so i mean I, I probably still don't even know why I've chosen to do some of the things and why we wrote it and made it. some of it is so coming from the unconscious or you know you're, you're responding but the use of humor um, it, it, for, for us in Ireland anyway and very much culturally we use humor as an absolute way of as a, as a defense mechanism like we're just the world's best at it like we can bat away a feeling and a, a, you know faster than anybody and we we have we also assign very high status to people who are very witty and and what it does is and that's why comedians are a uh, comedian is a really an important or interesting character or character type because it also cuts you off because then you become identified as the person who makes light of things or blah, blah, blah. and so there's the laughter and the humor is really, really important and really, really helpful, but it's also a way of hiding and not feeling. And so that was really, to me, fascinating for my main character, that there was a whole armor around her. And in a way, her journey through cancer was eroding the armor. Um, and heartbreak was one way of, a, a very big way that eroded it. So it's it's complex, isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, but loneliness, and isolation and um that's just such a an abyss isn't it for people mm. and for you know and i think when people are we we certainly have been trained to view cancer as this enormous boogeyman this terrifying and it is of course but more than that we're trained to have no relationship with our mortality you know we're not trained to deal with with the, pro the prospect of dying and so when it happens to somebody it's the shock and the isolation and that it's well you know I'm speaking as somebody who went on the journey with two people I lost but it's mm -hmm. it's not the same as being the person who's going on that journey I'm very aware of that yeah so I was communicating a cathartic story from that energy or experience I'd had that I was hoping by sharing could re uh, resonate with people Mm. And also, I mean, you brought you brought that aspect of a character in in the beginning. I mean, the quirky and interesting relationship she had with she has with her mother, the relationship she has with her brother and the children, you know, so that was all brought in. Uh, Anthea, looking at relationships and the the importance of of of, of being seen. Um, you do a lot of work with 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 young children. Would you take us on that journey? And and you know, as much as I'm sure there are a few sad elements to it, but there's also beautiful, um, rewarding elements that are that are also added to 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 spending that time with those precious souls. Most definitely. Um, the 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 only sad part of a child being diagnosed with diagnosed with cancer is cancer is today the diagnosis, tomorrow immediately. In many cases, treatment has to start. There is no time for the mom or the dad to even prepare themselves for the roller coaster that uh, lies ahead. So much more for the child because we've got parents um, whose hearts is breaking and they're telling their children, you know, you're going to be okay. But mm. they inside, they don't know if it's really going to be okay. We've got parents holding children down in order for doctors to put needles um, um, into the children to draw blood. And they're saying to the children, uh, um, it's going to be okay. They're doing this to, to make you better. And um, this, the sad part of, of this all is, is that that child was healthy a week ago. And now all of a sudden the child has been diagnosed with cancer. And then the treatment starts. And the next thing is where you lose yourself because you start um, losing your hair. Um, you start going through um, the terrible side effects that comes with, with chemotherapy. I think that is one of the most horrible things for anybody to go through. Um, and then, then there's also dealing with the fact that a child that was um, kicking a ball around now all of a sudden is in a bed unable to play with friends, also unable to have contact with um, their siblings. Mom that maybe used to work 
for um, seven days a week, all of a sudden now mom has to stand by a child's bedside and all of yeah. those things. So the, the treatment in itself, it's taxing and it's, and, it's, and it's hectic. But on the other hand, it is where you see the success stories, where you see children actually completing treatment, children ringing the bell. Um, the treatment tools we thought of the recover the children that you have to um, stand by and you have to prepare them for dying you have to prepare parents um, to release the children because medically there's no longer anything that can be done um, for wow. their child and I mean that you you as it is went through your own personal journey um you know, dealing with and then having to face, you know, the diagnosis and then your treat and 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 and, and uh, your treatment and so forth. How did you, or rather, should I say, where did you find the strength to then get into the work that you that you do do now, um, and you know, and the other work that you do for the Cancer Relay for Life Movement in South Africa? When I was going through my cancer journey, I basically went um, all the way on my own. Um, I think in part pride was holding me back. Also, um, when people hear you have cancer, automatically they bring death into that same room. So you are trying to get through through chemo, you're trying to get through the whole treatment, but you're surrounded with people who is trying to be as normal as possible, but they having the fear that you're going to die. Mm. Um, and that makes it scary in itself because I am the one that's going through the treatment. I am the one that is experiencing the side effects. And so it's like someone standing on the outside looking in, but they don't really know. And many times we focus on the physical implications of a cancer diagnosis. We, we sometimes uh, forget about the emotional implications. I always ask, why do people tell you they're sorry when the year that you have cancer? And then we talk about the financial implications that come. And sadly, in my case, um, it came to the point where I was homeless and I ended up in a shelter. So I know what it's like not to have anything. And I've been given this gift, which is a life. Mm -hmm. And that is why I can identify with the children because I've been there. And that is the difference. I know what it's like. I know what it's like when you feel that uh, doctors is telling you this, but your body is telling you something else. I know mm -hmm. what it's like to go to bed and wondering if you're going to see the next day. I know what that is like. I know what it's like not to have money to go to hospital. I know what it's like not to have something to eat because you were used to a certain type of food growing up. Now you're in a shelter setup and you don't know. the. You, you're not used to that. And if you're not going to eat what is presented to you, there's no option of going to the fridge and taking something else. So, and, and then the other, other side of it is, it's okay for, for me to joke about my cancer, um, but, we've, but we take offense when someone else jokes about it and things like that. So we see the humor in it and also the fact that when, 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 when I was feeling low, I would put on a comedy show on the TV and I would watch it, but whilst it's on, I will, instead of laughing, I will be crying many times. And then there's times when you, when you laugh. And that was good for me because it allowed myself to release all of that cropped up emotions because yeah. holding on to it was doing more damage than actually me releasing it. Yeah. And, and you know, that toll, what it plays on, on, on our bodies and our physiology on top of... From, from, you know, from the illness has its effects. Ruth, looking at the emotional pain and the fear of... Um, and it's understandable. It's really understandable. But the, our, our natural impulse is to try to hold, hold back, stay, you know, how far away from this pain and fear can I, can I get? And I, I found the closer that you go, the safer you are, you know? And I think that's what I, I was focusing on at the 
center of this film is that we meet a character who's doing everything not to feel and um and um and and, and it almost the question behind it all was what does it take to to open her to open her so the scene at the end uh, in the in the sea is like that that um th the whole experience of letting people in and being um affected by other people i mean it was it was it was it was tracking her going up close and into the pain and that release that Anthea is talking about like she had not been releasing and and it's funny the day we shot that film it, um it was i was in the sea with gemelia devro the main actress and um the heavens opened and these monumental raindrops came down and um and we were i was crying and laughing and I realized that it was like this kind of re literally this release of emotion so there was lots of layers to it but I think that was very I was very conscious all the way through that we cannot um, avoid pain you know it's going to happen um, one way or the other and it's about that relationship with it and, um, and I, I became really interested in I, I'm the kind of person who as well I just can't stand to be bullied and I, and I saw my like loved ones being really bullied by the terror and fear and I found that to be almost worse than anything because there was you know okay there, it's not worse than intense physical pain but next to that the um this this just it was like this threat of something that and then the more you look away and it's it's then it's getting bigger and bigger and um I wanted to actually have a character who was avoiding and avoiding and avoiding and then coming right into it and then going through it. And so that, that was a really central part of the storyline for me, the experience that I was following in, in the, and, and I don't, like, other people watching it might be seeing something entirely different. That's what I kind of love about filmmaking is that, you know, I tried to be as emotionally true to what was truthful for me. And I kind of believe, weirdly enough, that can morph into an entirely different interpretation for another person watching it. It doesn't have to be exactly the same meaning that I'm getting. Other, everybody has their own experience and they're going to look at it and they're going to see what they're going to mm. see, you know, so. You know, and, 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 and as you said, that's the beauty about, about storytelling and filmmaking is those other nuances that you pick up. I mean, one of the things, and we spoke about this before the panel discussion, was the interesting relationship that the character had with her mother? Mm. Um, you know, um, let's talk about about that 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 um, um, character arc in terms of that relationship. Because although the love was there, but it was very very much removed, but also fed into the type of nature that the character portrayed. Yeah, and there's an absent father who isn't really his his presence is there. You never see him. You know? You know, it was a big question in, in constructing the film for myself and Jean as well, is like, to what degree does this, this character's pain relate back, obviously and all of us, how we're formed, what happens to us in childhood, all of that's very formative, but to what, what did you have to know? Like, I felt um, there was a couple of scenes we shot or a few moments about her father, because there was huge fury in her, which you can tell from that scene when she throws the ashes around, you know, so you can see the implication is a lot of a lot of anger and resentment in her around her father and her mother she has this relationship with her mother but even at the end it's, it's so um i would like to think um and i don't know this but my sense is that because of the experience she went through with the women that she connected to and in particular the tracy character and even the intimacy with the pharmacist that 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 kind of anger and fury is somehow released to some degree it's the start of what she would have to do to be at peace it's not like oh all of a sudden she's fine and i was happy ever after it's more she has a chance maybe if she can open to life and reconcile it's really somebody who can't reconcile their life coming to terms with life that's my experience as well is that when everything is going really like when you're going through loss and grief you have two choices you're either going to continue to fight with life because it's not fair and it's awful and it's heartbreaking and you throw your toys out of the cot and you go i'm not having this which doesn't you don't come out very well 
or you kind of go, I cannot understand life. It doesn't make sense. However, I'm going with it. I'm going to have a relationship with being alive based on reconciling the fact that it's, that it's, um, it's, it's not something that I can control or make behave the way, and my happiness can't depend on life de behaving itself. Or mm. if, you, if it does, you're not gonna be very happy because it's not gonna behave itself. You yeah. know, so, um, so that was very much her, I think, having the, the kind of, the part of her that was having a, a kind of a tantrum with life, quiet, it was, was broken open mm. and I would like to think for Kate there is a, a, a chance for her it may, maybe just the start of her healing journey you know and part and a, bar, a large part of that would be her parents and like for all of us it, it's like letting our parents be who our parents are we can spend our you know our entire life in relation to the to what they mm -hmm. weren't for us or you kind of go with okay that's what that's that was their best because that's their internet it's intergenerational trauma they were dealing with what they were dealing yeah. with yeah and they were choosing and then, not to deal with with, yeah, with certain and, aspects of life yeah and and in the generation gone before they didn't have the resources and they didn't you know that's you know yeah we didn't have that communication no. but but looking on on outlook um anthea your motto has been i have cancer cancer doesn't have me um and and you said something very very powerful uh, earlier on about when people from the outside look in and the first thing that that and I've been and I'm going to say we because I've, I've been in that in that I've been guilty of that as well is that we say shame um, how can you how can we relearn and how can we make not make it better but be better humans in terms of of hearing um, that type of news and trying to be as supportive as possible um, sometimes you, you don't have to say something when someone tells you that they have cancer. Uh, um, sometimes they just need you to, to support them, whether it is quietly or whether it is just by giving them a hug. Because remember, to, to, to hear that word, it's, it's almost like now all of a sudden this life that you used to, all of a sudden is changing and now you need to get used to the new you and 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 like i also said uh, before why are you apologizing you never gave me the cancer you never made me sick why not just journey with me and be there for me but in my case and and I'm, i was to blame for this is was pride kept me back and also because i felt that the others that was older like my aunt she needed the support more than what i did and that i was okay to do this on my own also naive to think that friends would stick around and be there and when in when looking back that it was strangers that came across my path and that is when you earlier asked me where does real effort in it's like you are the person fighting the cancer and then the carer i was my own carer i took care of myself i was there for myself emotionally and um, the role for a carer, it's such a difficult one because there's no, when the doctors tell, tell, told me that I have cancer, they didn't ask me, now who's going to take care of you because this is the manual that the carer um, needs to follow and this is what's going to happen and then they need to apply this. And this. So uh, um, I was my own carer and only when it struck the second time around did I realize that I needed to focus on me and that is where self-love came in. And that is um, with, once you start having that self-love and once you start really start doing things for you, not for people outside, but when you own, own the, the fact that, yes, the cancer diagnosis is there, but there is treatment available. It's not the cancer of back in the 80s when we were told to keep quiet about it. There's not that stigma anymore about cancer that, oh, you've got cancer, so you're going to die and things like that. There's treatment available. If my cancer was caught early, there was treatment. I wouldn't have maybe have gone through the second time if I wasn't as naive as I was back back then. But then again, if I look back, I will say it's good that I was naive because it made me the person that I am today. You're mute there, Rosie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the aspect of, of self-love is also just so important in 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 any relationship and and in in, in any in any sphere of life um 
would you mind talking about just other for 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 people who are watching or who have other been diagnosed, not even just cancer, anything else on on ideas or or aspects of of different levels of self love? Because you know the inspirational quotes and the the women's magazines will say self love is going to a spa, and it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could just be the self talk that you're giving yourself or how you see yourself. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, I, I always like to do uh, um, poems and stuff. I'm not good at it, but I always try. And so I have this, um, um, regardless of my scars, whether visible or invisible, regardless of my past, regardless of what I've been through, regardless of where I've been, that I can stand in front of this mirror and I can tell myself that I love me. And that is the important part. When you look at yourself and you can say, you know what, this is the scars of my breast cancer. This is the invisible scars of the trauma that I went through. The fact that I felt um, rejected, the fact that I was alone, the fact that I felt nobody cared, that I love me. And mm -hmm. then and when you look at that person, that is the only time um, that you can really say that is self-love. Self-love is not what you wear or what you have. Self-love is loving you. For the person that you are. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Ruth, the, 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 you know, we've spoken about the different elements and the other themes of the film. Um, and it was it first, it was first um, released last year. What has been the response to the film and um, where do you plan to take it after here? Um, it, well, because of the pandemic, obviously it got it hit pause like many, like everything. Um, and then we had a, it premiered first uh, in the Cork Film Festival here in Ireland and it was online. Mm -hmm. And initially I was, you know, you, you, you make a film like this and you dream of being in a cinema with, uh, you know, all that goes with that. But it was a really um, wonderful experience actually because, it, and it was new, it was just at the start when people were trying to do things online. And then um, because it uh, was happening over a week, it actually gave, funny enough, there was quite a bit of word of mouth. So there was a, it, it, there was a lot of interest and um, I think a lot of women contacted each other and said, oh, and, and so it, it, it won the audience award. And I think a lot of that was, um, I, was, I, was I was surprised because I didn't have a clue how a, a, a film like this would resonate with people because I, I was aware that they were, difficult subjects that it's you know and, and people had said oh we can't possibly sell cancer in a pandemic and we can't possibly you know who's going to you know even if it is entertaining or a well-told story that mm. the feeling is we're all gone through such a difficult time that we really want escapism but actually I found to my surprise I thought it might split people I thought some people will resonate and really be get something from it and um, maybe other people won't or I thought maybe quite people might be upset with it or but actually I, it's been received incredibly well and um, the reviews were really good and um, it, it's you know it, it actually has landed the way I would have hoped you know mm. but but it, it's a weird thing about making any creative project you have to kind of go inside yourself and you're offering something and you're yeah. hoping you're touching the same nerve in other people or the same, you, you know, whether that's humor or, or, or feel a moment of um, deep emotion mm. that you're, you're, you're really working. You can't judge it from out there. You can't second guess, especially. And, and so it's a frightening, it's a very frightening experience for um, anybody because you're doing something incredibly public and you, 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 you might have to sit there in a cinema, look at your feet while everybody's mortified, <laughs> mm. you know, or, um, you, you get to make something and you get a huge sense. I have a huge sense of um, really pleasant surprise that the things that matter to me matter to other people. Yeah. You know, and um, and at the moment uh, it's, it's going to various festivals like yourselves, which is fantastic. And then um, it's been released here in Ireland and uh, we would hope I would love it to, we're talking to streamers, so, you know, fingers crossed, it will have another life online. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some interest in the States. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting time for the film industry, for every industry, but in particular, you know, um, everything has changed. Cinemas are really difficult. Uh, it's a very yeah. difficult industry. 
very difficult for cinemas to stay operational and there are supports mm. for them here but um there's a really big difference seeing a film in a cinema um, yeah it's gone mute no and it's very, there's a very big difference um and yet yeah it's a, it's a, it's like an experience when you sit in a dark room with other people mm. and you share that story it has it is a, it is one thing than sitting in a, a living room and you know Having said Watching that, it on your device or something like that. Yeah. You but know, but even, even with the pandemic, as you mentioned, was that, you know, life still goes on. People are still diagnosed with mm -hmm. cancer, with TB, with anything else. Uh, Anthea, in terms of creating awareness and, and using different platforms to assist uh, survivors and warriors, would, would a film like this um, be of good assistance or um, and this, this type of platform be useful in terms of the work that you do? it will be very useful because it will give other survivors, um, you know, if a group of survivors get together, we've, the common denominator is cancer. Mm. Um, and we can laugh about certain things that comes with a cancer journey. You can take your week off and you can laugh, you know, because you, you're in a comfort zone. Mm. And it would also be a nice thing uh, um, for, 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 for cancer survivors, but I think it would ideally be nice for, for, for the carers. Mm -hmm. uh, for those whose lives are impacted by the cancer journey to actually see that, you know what, you're asking me to look at the bright side. You're asking mm -hmm. me to, 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 to go through this cancer journey, but all that I see when I look at you is this dark cloud hanging over you. I can see that you are, you are thinking death where I am thinking life. Yeah. Uh, um, you are bringing death into the picture where I want you to celebrate with me, to enjoy the now not to worry about the then, but to worry about the now. So I think it would be good for, for carers, but equally it would be good for us as survivors because there's a lot that we can identify with. Mm. And the humor is certainly one thing. Uh, um, there is just a, I don't know how to explain it, just, there's just a, a language between people that goes through cancer. It's, it's like we get each other. Mm. And, and, and I mean, Ruth, your character brought it out in, in that scene where she was, when she was talking to her breast, which also feeds into to, to the theme of sexuality and femininity, um, you know, that, that, that um, impacts many survivors. Um, would you mind, let's talking about that journey and, and, and those themes. And then I think we have a few questions, yeah. Yeah, and I'd love to talk to Anthony about that as well, because, you know, you, you, you know how, it, you could be self-conscious if you have a bad hair day and you go, oh, my hair is dreadful. I look awful. Oh, I can't possibly be seen. And then you go, well, what if you have no hair? You mm -hmm. know, and, you know, how are, because we'd all like to think we don't really mind how we're seen or we're bubble. We're not like we're, we, we care, we, we care about, we try to show up looking well, being and, and looking healthy. And, looking, and so watching people that you love lose, um, have to cope with the erosion of their sense of self-worth that our culture is just so tyrannical about, you know, um, and it's why in this, in, in there's that scene where the little girl even says, if you've no hair, no boobies, are you still a woman? And I just mm -hmm. found, oh my God, I was heartbroken myself going, well, what is it to be a sexual attractive woman, you know? And how do, uh, how do women who, and, and the breast, there's a kind of an attempt in the way I filmed it as well to be a celebration of breasts as well. Mm. And even, even that very sad sex scene where Andy is overcome by grief. And you, you think, well, we never even think about the men who lose women, who, you know, who lose women to breast cancer and also who love breast, who have a love of the breast, you know, mm. and, and the, lo the loss of the breast. And, you know, it can be seen very medical. We just have to chop off these breasts and you'll be fine. And it's like, well, hang on a second. <laughs> What about my sense of feeling good about being a, alive as a woman and, and also then being able to reclaim that? Like there's the women have a chat in the bar and they talk about the loss of their boobs and they talk about it very candidly, deliberately. And, and there's it's not black and white. And one woman is saying, oh, I thought I'd be OK, but I'm not. And, the other woman is giving out to a girl for tweeting her scars and, and she's saying, I'm proud I've survived. And so you have all these perspectives 
And then there's that scene in the lake where the, the fake boob comes out and they're roaring laughing, you know, and you're kind of going, it's trying to capture um, the, re the reality of the, the, the fear, the real poignancy around that. And also then you're more than that too, but also mm. that's hugely difficult to cope with. So it's coming from an empathic place of what it, so as best as I could possibly, having gone through that with my friend and sister, and, and also being somebody who has to open the door to their loved one and they've lost all their hair. And then you're trying to be, how do you, like you were saying, Anthony, like you just need to be, uh, recognize and acknowledge what they're going through. So you're not trying to pretend it's not happening. And yet not catastrophize it. So, oh my God, life's over, you've no hair. Like it's really difficult for everybody, but in particular for the woman. So I think sexuality, your sense of, I don't mean having sex. I mean, your sense of yourself as a, sexual being and an attractive person whatever that means to you and how breast cancer i thought that was very important that that was in there um i agree with you because i i i, I always um say that uh, um i am not my breast my breast is not me my breast is merely a part of my anatomy and that's who it is you know um so uh, um although my body has physically changed me as a person has not changed. Yes, I've, um, with cancer comes a, a, a level of maturity because I see it with children, you know? And, and so, so, so in that way, I have changed because the person that I was back then is not the person that I am now because I have that deeper appreciation for life. Mm. I've got that deeper appreciation for the fact that I can open up my eyes. I've got that deeper appreciation, but my anatomy does not define me. And that is and 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 that is why I say we can joke about it because we can sit and then you can take out your prosthesis and you can say, look at mine, feel mine, feel you know, that type of thing, because it is it doesn't define who we are. Yes, a lot of uh, a lot of women sadly uh, um, get gets divorced because the husband's is the boob the boob is the object of the love, but it's like and also because many times they don't know how to deal with the loss because it's like mourning the loss of something. It's a part that was there that they were used to and all of a sudden now it's not there. And that also becomes a constant reminder when you look at that scars, it reminds and it triggers, although we as a survivor has moved past that, but the person whose life has been affected by the cancer diagnosis can be a trigger at any time because it is a reminder of what was. And also, um, you know, it's a big ask, but it's really, you talked about maturity. I mean, these things can really help uh, create leaps of ev evolving, like maturity in people, because you can, you know, as you get older anyway, that idea of what is attractive, like, you know, having yourself defined by what you look like, which is a huge pressure on everybody is um, it, in a way it's like, you can, like you say, Anthea, you, you, you come back to, I'm alive, I'm attractive in that I am life. <laughs> like, and, and a very deep connection, if, if you're able to find it through, through the loss, mm -hmm. you're, if you're able to, it's an incredible gift. It's a hard one to find because you've got to go through a very difficult terrain to get there emotionally. Um, but if you can connect with that self-care you were talking about earlier and own the beauty of being alive unconditionally it, it life is asking you to have a relationship with it that's not conditional on you having even your appearance the way you would like it mm -hmm. now a lot of people understandably would find that very hard we all find that hard but if if you can manage it there's a huge freedom behind that Do you know there's like okay this is it this is how i am this is my life this i'm i'm owning all of this i'm going you know i'm embracing myself i'm my i'm i'm precious to me you know and my life is precious to me and those kind of that kind of territory people don't go into very often unless they absolutely have to yeah. why would you because it's it's very hard yeah, that you know? reflection I, is very difficult and it's and it's literally stepping into a place saying i'm reclaiming this but it's not something that you willingly gave over or or handed over no. and uh, were you going to say something uh, yes, it's, I definitely agree with both of you because you go through all of the emotions, you go through the resentment, you go through the anger, you go through the fear, you go through all of those things. And it's a really, it's a long 
and it's a hard process. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. It really takes digging deep into yourself because cancer really knocks you. It knocks yeah. you big time. And that even, I mean, I'm looking at one of the questions that's come through from an anonymous attendee. Um, this is directed for both Ruth and Anthea. This film and the discussion takes us into deep appreciation of life, as Anthea says. Um, what does it take to be so open about such, such deep life experiences? And I mean, you've touched on that, but would you like to add on anything to that? Um, I grew up in the 80s with people dying around me. I grew up where cancer was a big secret. It was the big C, we never openly spoke about it. But I saw it first, I saw it first then with my aunt and I really, I really saw the, the really ugly side of cancer. I really see how it robs you and how it drains life out of you. And then when I was diagnosed, I also saw the other part of it. I saw the part of um, where people um, would desert you, people would push you aside, I saw that. I saw the side of, of not being able to survive. I saw the part of uh, um, me being able to look after older people that has been diagnosed with cancer, worked for children, put them through colleges, but yeah, they are stage four cancer and there's no one around. So I've seen, I've seen cancer at all levels. I've been there. I've stood there when people was busy dying, when children was busy dying. I saw that back and forth um, with parents um, releasing the child and then claiming the child back. I saw all of those. I saw beautiful moments where children was given back. I saw children dying. I saw all of those things. So I, I, I've seen, I've seen, I think I've seen cancer through so many, so through so many um, eyes, but I also realized that the cancer, that, uh, that the, the cancer, the, the disease, mm -hmm. If it is caught early, if you start your treatment, your chances of survival is so much greater. It is not, um, you have cancer, go sit in the corner and wait for yeah, me. Yeah. Cancer actually gives you the opportunity to say, yes, I've got cancer. I'm putting my big girl panties um, on and I'm going to take this thing on and I'm going yeah. to fight. Remember, I was at the point of nothingness. And we think sometimes we think all the material things that we have, that is what we need to hold on. I was at the point of nothingness and God really took me to nothingness to, in order to appreciate the greatest gift, which is life. It's not a house, it's not a car, it is life. Mm -hmm. and, and so I've, I've been there, I've been through it all. And um, so yeah, cancer, definitely not a dead sentence. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you know, you, you appreciated that, but then you're creating a different journey for the children that you work for. So that's really commendable. Ruth, you were well, going to say something? First of all, I just think it's beautiful to hear Anthea, um, because basically what I hear you talk about there, Anthea, is you've witnessed enormous heartache and heartbreak. And uh, through that darkness, the, 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 the light, which is life, you know, which is why I was saying the film's called The Bright Side, but it is a deep ask of life when it's asking you to look at that level of suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and the person is asking how to have a relationship with this. And I think the key is in that. And it's what I was saying earlier is like, it's understandable that we want to turn away from looking, actually looking at suffering and, and engaging and feeling it ourselves. Um, but for me, that is the where the rubber meets the road. That the degree to which you can stay present with suffering, and like you, you're you're literally physically being mm -hmm. present in with children and with others because of the depth of your empathy from your own experience. And I feel like on a smaller scale, I I experienced that with the death and loss of my sister and my friend. But I felt the real in the real enlivening. Um, where the energy comes back in instead of draining out of you into depression and despair is in being able to let it be there mm -hmm. it, let it be what it is you know it takes sometimes it takes a long time to get to there but to be staying present with the suffering and the pain and then to just go okay I'm going to trust 
it's a deep trust which is really hard that, that somehow even i don't understand none of this makes sense that there is a there is life itself is enough you know and you know people give up sometimes because they go i don't want lit life if it's not if it's this difficult bad stuff whereas if you can stay with it that's what my sense is mm-hmm. um that and, that, and acknowledging that, because, you know, as Anthea said before, 10, 15 years ago, cancer was put in the corner. Don't talk about it. Don't even mention it. Mm. But if you take acknowledgement and you not give it agency, but, 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 but see it, it's in the room. And then you deal with, 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 with that demon in the room. Yeah. And what Anthea is doing was, I mean, it's so powerful because they, I come back again to the fear, the fear that hits people when they hear somebody that and they just it's just nobody can. The communication di- that like everything is off people can't talk and they can't connect and it's just if you're somebody who can be a conduit who can stay with that mm. and it, other people are very 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 grateful for anybody who can be uh not freaked out you know actually be there and be present and stay in the stay connected like if you're there with a child and you're, the child knows that you're not frightened, you're connected. You're not trying to plaster it over and say, it's fine, it's fine. Mm-hmm. You're just going, I'm here and I'm not afraid. Yeah. Like that is worth its weight in everything. Yeah. Gold, diamonds, everything. Do you know, I'm here and I'm not afraid to be here. And if it, if, it, if it gets really messy, if it gets really awful, I'll stay here. Do you know, um, that's really a, a beautiful thing that you're doing with mm-hmm. your life, I think amazing um so we have one more question which i think we'll have time for ruth could you talk about what your inner personal journey when making the film and you've touched on a lot of that already but would you like to add anything else to that yeah i would say that i for many years irrationally had a deep desire to make films and was deeply attached to whether or not I was any good and could make them. So it took me a long time to make this film, this first feature. I'm, I'm very long in the tooth to be making a first feature. But um, my experience of loss and grief did make me feel I lo- uh, uh, have a relationship with life unconditionally. So I, I had no fear in making this because I wasn't trying to be a great director or I wasn't concerned about whether I was any good. I just want to tell the story. And um, that's the beauty of when you lose everything. You just kind of, I, co- I couldn't waste, I couldn't be bothered wasting a second on being afraid. I thought, I'll do my very best. It'll be what it is. I'll take the disappointment if things don't work out. I'll take the delight if it does. But my own personal journey as a filmmaker has been hugely impacted by, um, and liberated, absolutely liberated as a creative person. Um, And I'm not for a second saying I don't care what people think about it. I do care and I do get elated if people enjoy it and disappointed if they don't. But ultimately, it it, it was so freeing. And then I had this relationship with my love of it. You know, I connected to the love of making this story. And I had an incredibly joyous experience doing it and working collaboratively with an incredible crew. Um, you know, I had a lovely producer, Tony, and, and, and I had just a great, you know, everybody from the cinematographer, the, the editor, the, the designer, all the cast, all the actors. It felt like, and the, the, like the woman who worked so hard on the wigs, like there's just every element of it. You just, feel, I just felt a huge synergy and appreciation. I don't think I could have connected or felt that or made a film that way without kind of having been stripped back myself by loss and grief. So that, you know. It's, it's all one and the same. Yeah. And it's all about, as you mentioned, connections and, and, and synergies. So in closing, Anthea, I mean, the work you do um, with children, with the Cancer Association of South Africa is incredibly rewarding, but it doesn't survive on thin air. Um, and so, so what support um, from, you know, would you need um, you know, not just about when it comes to October, we're we'll going to talk about breast cancer. What, you know, for people that are watching that could um, put their money where their mouth is or their, their resources, you know, we're living in a pandemic, so people might not be able to sign those checks, but they can provide skills or resources. You know, if you had a wish wand, um, what would it be? What, 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 what do you need as a warrior to continue with this journey? Um... Praise, first and foremost, praise. 
Um, and then the second thing is if there's someone that can do wigs for children. And then there's also um, coloring books and crayons is always welcome, mm -hmm. as well as a toiletry pack. Because remember, a lot of our children come from impoverished communities. Um, so that would make a, a big difference. And then also, if there is anybody that just wants to come and spend some time with our children, come and encourage our mommies. Come and allow our children to paint their nails. Um, I teach the children to own the journey, um, mm -hmm. not the cancer, but the journey, mm -hmm. and allow themselves to go through the journey. I, I teach them about celebrating life. I teach them about making the most of each day. Um, so first and foremost, faith is the, one of the biggest things. And then, like I said, just time. Come and show time, give time, give time to a child that is fighting cancer. Um, be there for a mom who's going through, through um, being there with a child um, that is fighting cancer. Um, yeah, the, I can go on for, for days talking about cancer, um, not just our children, but just um, women in general. Um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Our top five is out and breast cancer is still number one. Number two is cancer of the cervix. Number three is colorectal cancer because why we worry. And number four is cancer of the uterus and number five is lung cancer. I'm talking about um, encouraging women, please do your monthly breast self examinations. Please go for your memos. Please go for your pap smears. It starts with you. Listen to your body. If your body is telling you that something is wrong, do not ignore it because you are so scared that it is cancer. Do not go and ask the auntie across the road and um, you know you've got the same symptoms as this. And no, please go and seek medical advice because it, um, we are pushing hard for early detection meaning treatment can start early, therefore your chances of survival increase. We do not, it's, it's people don't have to die of cancer. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, it's very important, yes, get the medical attention. And as much as the internet is a great resource for us, Dr. Google can also have its negative effect. So um, as you know, as Anthea said, do the mammograms. Um, there are different, so many different organizations. I know DSTB sponsor um, Cancerthon and the Mammogram, especially during this month. Um, as we know, the Cancer Association of South Africa can be found on all platforms. They're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they have a website. Um, you know, knowledge is power. So, so I think that you're doing. Um, there's also just another uh, message, which I think I definitely need to read out. This is from HO. Thank you so much. Um, Anthea and Ruth, you are incredibly inspirational. Um, and then from Alison McKenna, what a learning curve this event has been. Sure. So eloquent, each of you. So insightful and so absolutely life-defining. I cried. Thank you. Wow. Um, so, wow. Thank you for that message. And um, Ruth, in closing, what would you like to say in terms of your film and the message. And once again, from my point of view, it really, really was a beautiful film. And I thank you for that. I would just really like to thank, uh, you know, everybody who, who watches it and receives something from it because ultimately it's a, it's a communication, you know, um, and it's communication of love, mm. you know, um, through fear. And uh, um, so when it was, when it was stuck without an audience because of the pandemic, it was the strangest feeling. So for to have it shared and experienced is, um, you know, such a gift to me. So I'm just so delighted that, uh, that it, it might be um, moving or inspirational or in some way supportive mm -hmm. and that people can feel the love in it because I feel that's my own love for my, like the people that I love. I feel they're in it, you know. So um, that's really, really beautiful experience. So mm. I'm so grateful for that. And also, just to listening to Anthea, I'm, I'm full of awe and appreciation 
for what she's doing because I may have done it in a small way for some people I loved, but you're doing it in a very large way. And, you know, just to, that I, I really would encourage people to support, of course, you know, what, you, what, we're, what we're just hearing. I just think this is really important work. So, yeah. Thank you. And, you know, we, we're living in a time where we're operating differently. So for the corporates out there, for your CSI, I um, sponsor screening of the film so that at least the filmmaker earns something, but then also, you know, something goes to the Cancer Association of South Africa. Well, I um, as would say I would be so happy for the film once once it's possible to be used as a fundraiser. I would love mm-hmm. that, you know, so, you know, that 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 would be I, I was saying just before we came on that. Um, the Macmillan Foundation in Britain got in touch to, to look at using uh, some scenes to help people who are going through cancer. And I, and I was just delighted that not only might it act as a great mm-hmm. story that could move people or inspire them, but it actually could yeah. be even more um, useful, you know, as a tool. So that's just Absolutely. any way that it can help. And then from a practical point of view, you know, you can look up the Cancer Association and see the amazing work that Anthea is also doing. But as she mentioned, wigs for children, coloring books, um, toiletry packs, um, all skills, you know, just just to buy the time for the children you have to go in. So so both of you, I salute you, you know, your own activists in your own right. And for me, that is what the journey is about. That is what life is about, is that we doing our bit the best way we know how. And so so for Ruth, congratulations again to you, your cast and crew, phenomenal, phenomenal film. And to Anthea, may may the angel soar with you continuously because you really, really are doing God's work and we appreciate you and we see you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you to everybody else who tuned in to listen. Um, not an easy topic, but it's an essential topic because it's still here. It was here before the pandemic. Um, it's gonna be here after the pandemic, but the way we react to it, the way we treat it, the way we deal with it, the way we live with it is very, very different. So educate yourself, not just the specific months of the year when it's um, breast cancer month or whatever it is, is that you know your body, listen to it. If it's telling you something or, or, um, something off, go and get it checked. There are organizations, if you don't have the financial resources, there are organizations that can help you. Um, if you follow me on social media, I will be tagging some of these organizations, but of course the main one, which is the Cancer Associ- Association of South Africa, and the acronym is CANCER. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to the European Film Festival for hosting this and for, 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 for screening such a powerful film. Until then, God bless. Thank you.